Okay. And um, welcome to the, oh, where are we? I think the 10th lesson of the Aleph Tav Ancient Hebrew Course. I am super excited about tonight. As I was preparing for tonight's lesson, I really got an amazing um, revelation. So I just want to um, lift up this lesson and lift up tonight to Abba and to ask him to really um, allow his spirit and to let his spirit reveal it to you as well. So it will be something special for each one of you. Um, but I've decided to, to leave the big <laughs> um, diamond for the end of the lesson. So I'm going to work through the um, lesson as we normally do going through the homework and then the two letters. And then afterwards I will share um, what's on my heart for those of you who might have um, yeah, family to attend to or, or can't stay later, but it will be on the, on the video later on to watch. <coughs> so I'm gonna start with the share screen. So for tonight's lesson, the two letters we are looking at, Easter letters, Pei and Tzad. Let's go full screen. Okay, so I'm opening the chat box as well. As usual, we will first look at last week's homework or the two weeks ago. So um, we've all been out of practice for, <laughs> for a week or two. Um, but I hope you have something to share with me tonight. So the homework that I gave you in the last lesson was um, the word sukkah. Um, we were all in the festive season and we were celebrating the feast of Sukkot. So this word sukkah means a booth or cover. And the Israelites were commanded to build sukkahs for themselves during this festival. So the word sukkah is spelled sin, kaf, and hay. Um, so yeah, I would like to, to see what you guys find in the pictures. So if anybody has an interpretation or something that they did at home, please share so on the, on the chat. So to make it a bit easier for you, I wrote, wrote down the different meanings of each letter. So we first have the letter sin, which has the meaning thorn, to pierce, sharp, to turn. It can be a shield, uh, a shield of thorn or thorn bushes. <clears throat> it can mean protect, to grab hold or hate. Then we have calf, that can mean palm, sole, press, open, bend, subdue or tame. And then we have hay, that can look, behold, look, breath, Sigh, reveal, spiritual, repentance, and fruitful. So if you look at all three of those letters, what do you see in the word sukkah? <clears throat> Thank you, Pietri. So Pietri says, Abba's protection opens our hearts and bring us to a willingness to teshuva. So if you all remember, teshuva means to turn and repent. Thank you, Pietri. That's a beautiful interpretation. Um, So you said Abba's protection opens our hearts to bring us to a willingness to teshuva. So teshuva comes from the letter sin. Um, protection comes also from sin and the open comes from the opening of the heart and Abba's spirit. You said Abba's protection, but it can also be Abba's spirit that opens your heart to repentance and it leads you to um, to repentance. Thank you, Pietri, for your um, participation. It's a beautiful and a correct um, breaking down of the, of the word sukkah. Anybody else that would like to share what they found? So, um, I will share with you now what, what, what I saw, but we, we also have to remember that Sukkot is the last festival that will um, be kept before or at the coming of Messiah. But it's the last festival that has to be fulfilled. 
And it's also about our um, covering our sins at last, that there will be no sins, no spot, no blemish left. It will be covered forever. So, um, yeah, it will actually make an end to Teshuvah as well, because we will be whole and um, totally in sync with them. So let me share with you what, what stood out for me is the words protect, the word palm, and the word behold, which is very similar to what Pietru saw. And if you put those together, it says, behold the pierced palm that covers and protects. And as, I, as I've just explained that Sukkot is about that last festival where we will dwell with him um, and where his pierced hand, what he did on the cross for us, will finally cover all the sin and all the blemishes, all debts will be paid off. So, um, but again, it's not the only interpretation, but that's what I saw in the word sukkah. I hope you found this one interesting. <clears throat> okay, so our first letter for tonight is the letter pay. Last, um, in the last lesson, we did the letter ayin, which was a picture of the eye. So we are still busy with the face and we are now looking at pay. So the name of the letter is pay. The pronunciation of the letter is a per sound as in paper, but it can also be a, a f sound as in the Afrikaans F um, or as in phantom PH. The picture is a picture of an open mouth. So the meaning of the picture can be, again, the direct meaning is mouth. Um, it can be open because it's a picture of an open mouth. It can mean to speak. And that's one of the functions of the, the mouth. It can mean word, um, a word or a sentence, because that's what you do or say when you speak. Um, it can mean blow, another function of the mouth. It can mean breathe because um, you're blowing your breath out. Um, it can also mean uh, um, the edge because your lips are, um, is the edge of your mouth. So the numerical value of the letter pay is 80. <clears throat> so the parent root word um, pay is spelled pay and hay and it literally means mouth. Um, behold the mouth and the meaning is to blow or mouth. Um, different combinations of the interpretation of the pictures can be to blow out your breath, because remember, hey can also mean breath or, or spirit. So together, it means to blow out your breath. It can mean um, to open a revelation. Um, it can mean to speak repentance. Again, you can com combine the, the two pictures and see um, all the different interpretations. Um, what is interesting though is I saw that there are different parent roots that have similar meanings. Um, you have a parent root pa, which is spelled pe alef, um, which means mouth. You get the parent root pe, um, pe yat, which means edge, and then you have the parent root word pam, which is spelled pe ma. And it also means mouth. But the name of the letter is pay hey, and it means mouth, mouth or blow. So let's quickly look at how this letter developed. So on the left, we have the ancient Hebrew. And in some of the videos and texts that I've watched, um, I saw that they also used this form um, of the ancient Hebrew. There are usually different forms that appear in history, but then they will look at which one appears more frequent um, and makes more sense regarding the meaning of the word and the letter, and, and that's the one that's then usually used. So in your ancient Hebrew lexicons, you will see the picture on the left um, is the one that is used in the lexicon. But on the right is one that's also often used, and I know Jeff Benner also used this picture in some of his videos to teach. So it's kind of like a, a skewed smile or open mouth. 
Um, so the ancient pictograph was found as an inscription in Egypt around 2000 BC, and it evolved into the middle script about 1000 BC. So you can see the similarity between the ancient Hebrew, the picture on the right, and the middle script. It doesn't look much like the, um, the ancient Hebrew on the left. But this letter, the middle script, became the Greek um, letter pi, um, and pi is still used today, and it also became the Roman letter P. Um, I think around the fourth century BC, it evolved into the late Hebrew, or the late script, and later, um, obviously, into the modern Hebrew. So the late script is what is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then Pei also has um, a medial and a suffit form. It depends on, on where you find it um, in a word in the modern Hebrew. So it has an open and a closed form, as you can see there on the right-hand side. Okay, so an example of a parent word that starts with the letter P. I chose the word pal, which is spelled pay lam, and it means to plead, but is often translated as the word to pray. Um, it can also be translated as judge, and the reason for this is if you look at the <clears throat> the pictures of the of the letters P and lam. It's the picture of the open mouth and the picture of the shepherd's um, staff, which means authority. So if you combine them, it means to speak to authority. And it refers to as one going to somebody in a, a position of authority higher than yourself to intercede on your own behalf or on behalf of a family member. So you go to somebody to judge a matter. So it's almost as if it's referring to doing a, um, a petition. It's not just a, a prayer where you speak and, and share your heart with Abba, but it's where you go to get a verdict that you go before a judge and um, you do intercession. Okay. So let's quickly look at the numerical value of pay. So pay has the numerical value of 80. Um, in the last couple of lessons, we've spoken about using the base number and then um, multiplying that by 10. So the base number is eight. And if you can remember, eight means to, to put off, to put off the flesh, which leads to a new beginning. Um, sorry, so if we, be, if we combine that with 80, it means to completely put off the flesh and be accepted to Abba. So now that you are in a state where Abba can reveal himself um, through you. We see um, in scripture the examples given to us um, of Moshe. So Moses was 80 years old when Abba sent him to Egypt um, to deliver his people. And it's quite an old age. <laughs> to do this, to, to have this big um, assignment by the age of 80. But I think um, the symbolism of his age is also very, very important. I think by that age, you come to a point where you're not as um, aware of your flesh. And especially if you've had walked um, on a journey with Abba, you're on a place where you have died yourself so much and you're more open and willing for Abba to work um, through and with you. Um, we also see um, Reed of Caleb. He was 85 when he overthrew, I think it was one of the Midianite cities or camps. I can't remember exactly. But again, him being um, completely putting off his flesh and walking in that position of authority. But this is the positive meaning of the number 80. And as with all the other numbers and letters we've looked at, it can usually have a positive or a negative um, interpretation. So if we look again towards the word, we see um, 
AT was also mentioned in the ages of uh, Methuselah and Lamech. So Methuselah was Noah's grandfather and Lamech was his father. And they both represent the rejected generation that was judged. Um, and, you know, in essence, they were <laughs> wiped off the face of the earth. Um, some other Hebrew words with the numerical value of 80 is the word foundation and the word strength. And this was also interesting to me because at this ripe, ripe old age of 80 was an age of strength where Moses was able to walk again in that authority and also Caleb. You won't think of a, a man of 80 as being somebody who possessed strength, but um, I think it's about having that strength of character that Abba brought forth in, in his fires and in his testings. Um, again, if we, if we look at the, the story of Moshe and how he went to, to Egypt to free the people of Abba, um, AT can also refer to the start of an era of freedom from oppressors. Um, so what is interesting to me, just go back here. Um, sorry. Uh, what's just interesting to me is if we look at Sukkot, Sukkot is the only feast that has eight days and not seven like Pascha. And again, eight refers to, um, to put off the flesh and that there's a new season, a new era coming, um, a new beginning, um, which will be then eternity or a thousand year, years of peace um, with Messiah. So if we look at here, that 80, that's now eight, um, so court has eight days, but 80 means to completely put off. In other words, the Sukkot of Sukkot, the final Sukkot. And then if 80 also refers to the start of freedom of oppressors, that that will be the beginning of a season where we will not be oppressed by our enemy. Um, and then some last examples of where you can find 80 in the scriptures is King Ehud. Um, he was the longest reigning judge over the nation of Israel. He was actually, I think, a very a good king in the beginning. Um, he was a left-handed warrior and he delivered Israel from a lot of enemies, but then he became full of pride um, and he went into the temple and he wanted to offer incense to Abba. And you are not allowed to do that if you are not a priest. So the high priest and 80 of the other priests came and they rebuked him and he in turn um, um what do you call it he, he became leprous um, because leprosy and pride is connected as well so that is um oh no that is king Uzziah. so king Ehud, i can't remember the story now i got confused with it too i just know okay he was he was one of the longest reigning judges King Isaiah was the one who wanted to offer the incense. Sorry, it's standing here right in front of me. Um, there's not, the, the higher you go in the numbers, there's not many examples as you will get with, for example, 12 and 7 and, and, and more of the familiar numbers. But um, it is interesting when you do get that number in the Bible to see how you can um, interpret it in the, in the context. So, as usual, I try to get a connection between um, the meaning of the letter, pay, which we know means speak, word, uh, mouth, or edge, and then the meaning of the number. So the number 80, we've now said, means um, to completely put off the flesh and be accepted. So this was a beautiful scripture that connects the two for me, is James 3 verse 2, which says, we all fail in many areas, but especially with our words. Yet, if we are able to battle the words, we say we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way. 
And that means our character is mature and fully developed. And I think when you become mature, you are ready to harvest, so you will be accepted. Um, as it will be accepted by Abba. Um, and again, I just want to men mention here that you have to remember it's about um, not only riddling your words, but actually um, walking the, the path of purification so that your heart will be pure. It's the same with the previous lesson when we talked about the letter Ayin when we said it's about not just seeing, but to really understand, to have that insight. So it's not about um, um, riddling your tongue and just not saying what is um, mean or not wrong or not judging others, but to not think like that in your heart, because what your heart is full of, your, your mouth will speak um, in any way. So that was the connection for me between the letter pay um and the number 80. Um somebody is asking me if my internet is okay um because they um they are losing connection the whole time so on my side everything looks fine I just want to ask if anybody else is experiencing the same thing. I'm sorry, um, Alma, I hope really that you can um, sort this out. Um, everybody else seems to say it's fine on their side, so it might be on your side. Sorry, Alma. So the video will be okay to watch later on, so you won't miss anything. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the letter pay, so let's move on. So our next letter is the letter Tzad. In modern Hebrew, it is called um, Tzadi. Um, I just want to double check if I've mentioned everything about pay because <laughs> I want to get to the end. Um, I just don't want to miss anything. Yes, I think I've covered everything. Oh, I just wanted to mention this. As I've just said about um, remembering the previous lesson where we spoke about the letter Ayin, which means to see or to know, but it's, it's about a, a deeper spiritual level than trying to understand, to, to watch and observe, trying to understand somebody. Um, and the same with pay, to speak, um, but to really try to change your heart and to speak with wisdom. So what's really beautiful, they say the reason pay comes after Ayin the mouth comes after the eye, is because you have to speak with understanding. You first have to observe and try to understand and then speak. And if you do that, you won't speak foolish things um, so easily because you would see and think and observe before you just say something. Um, that was the last thing. Okay. So the letter Tzad. So the letter Tzad is the 18th letter of the alphabet. Um, as I said in the modern Hebrew, it's called Tzadi. Um, the pronunciation is a sound, like a drum would make. Um, an example is like Tzitzi fly. The T is sound you get there. Um, the picture you see, uh, again, it changes. Um, but this is the most common picture in the ancient Hebrew. Um, it's a picture of a man lying on his side. Um, or it can also represent a trail leading to a point. As you would see, um, the circle being the destination and the squiggly being the, the journey or the road that you have to take to arrive at um, the certain point. But still, the two pictures, the meanings, are connected. Um, so the meaning can mean side, as a man that's lying on his side. It can mean hunt, because when you go down to lay on your side, you're usually hunting. It can mean chasing um, or ambush. It can mean to hide, because the reasoning behind it is 
when you go down to lay on your side, you're either sleeping, you're hunting, or you are hiding. <laughs> so it can mean to hide, it can mean to journey. Um, when you go hunting, you usually go on a journey and you track an animal. But also, again, the two pictures that are connected, the trail leading to a point, you go on a journey to get to a certain destination. Um, it can also mean stronghold. There's a connection between side and stronghold. Um, and it can also mean need. Um, somebody who goes down on his face, it, it reminds me of somebody praying, hey, going down on your side and laying with your face to the floor in need in, um, in front of Abba. So this is actually, again, a beautiful letter. And our gem that we're going to talk about later tonight has to do with the letter Tzad. So the numerical biblical value for Tzad is 90. I just wanted to show you these two pictures. Um, as I've said, it can mean a man laying on his side or it can mean a trail leading to a point. So there's this place in Israel. Um, we went there. We are very blessed to, to, to visit Israel last year, just before COVID happened. And there's this place called Masada. It's the most visited tourist place in the all, of, all of Israel. Um, but I'm not going to tell you the whole story now. But it's this fortress, the stronghold on the top of a hill. And there's this long winding road. You can either take the cart up, which we did, or you can take the steps and, and the, the um, hike all the way up. And it's this long winding road up all the way to Masada. And it's just exactly this picture of this winding road that takes you to, to a stronghold, a place of protection or to a destination. This is just Masada from the other side. So this is what it looks like on the top of the hill. And this is the winding road. You have to take up the mountain to get there. Okay. The letter Tzad. So the parent root that spells the name of the, the letter is spelled Tzat and Dal. Um, so if we look at the pictures, we know now that Tzat means side, man that lays on his side, and then the Dal means door. We also know that it refers to the Messiah. And the root word Tzat has the meanings to hide, it means side and it means stronghold. So if we combine the, the meaning of the pictures, we get the deeper meaning to journey through the door, to go on a journey with, with Messiah. Um, it can mean to move in ambush, which is what you do when you hunt, remembering that it means to chase, to hunt. Um, so to move in ambush, to hunt something. So I just wanna ask you a question here. And I want to ask you to keep this question in your mind, because again, we're going to go back to this at the end. But what is the side of the door? If I said that, remember, the door refers to the Messiah. And if the literal meaning of the pictures mean the side of the door, what does that refer to? I hope you are all very um, mesquite. <laughs> Okay, curious about what I want to share with you. Um, so let's quickly look at how the letter Tzad developed. So on the left, we have the ancient Hebrew. Um, again, the, the two different forms. On the left, we have the one that's a man on his side. Um, and on the right, it's similar, but it's got the straight line, which refers more to a journey and a destination where you need to get to. The pronunciation is um, in the modern and the ancient Hebrew. Then you get the middle script. So the middle script looks very similar than the ancient Hebrew or the one on the right. Um, it's just a bit more rigid. Um, so at the bottom I wrote there for you. It's just interesting for me to see the, the times when it switched over from ancient to middle script to late script. So I decided to add the, that for you. So the ancient Hebrew um, 
evolved into the middle script around 1000 um, BC. Um, and the middle script became the archaic Greek letter sun. But this letter um, is not, it's not used anymore today. So that's why it's archaic. Um, it it fell, fell away. And then around the fourth century BC, the middle letter changed into the late script, which is just a simplified version. It looks to me like our letter R. Um, and it's also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But in the Dead Sea Scrolls already, um, they found it in two different forms. Where you could already see that they have a medial and a suffit form of different letters. Then we have the modern Hebrew on the right, and the medial form, and then also again, the suffit form. Again, looking almost like the letter Y. An example of a parent word. So the word I chose as an example is the word ton. And ton means uh, a flock of sheep, a flock. And it's spelled with a tzad, a vav, and a nun. The word um, ton means sheep or flock. And if you look at the pictures, it means to hide and secure the seed or the next generation. And again, that in relation to Yeshua refers to us. We are the next generation and he protects us because we carry his seed. Um, again, it relates to our topic for later tonight. The numerical value of Tzad. So again, going to the base number, so we are at the end of the tens, the tens, twenties, thirties. <laughs> the base number um, is nine. Um, we did speak about it resembling um, the harvest and that when you look at the, from sowing to reaping, that there is nine steps in the harvest process. Um, so it refers to the harvest or the fruit, the fruit that we are supposed to produce, which will be the harvest. Um, it can also refer to the finality of judgment. So if you multiply nine times 10, remember 10 being to weigh something to see if it is accepted or not. It means that the fruit has been expected. So now you've completed all the steps from sowing the seed from step one um, to step nine. And step nine is where you've harvested the fruit. And now it must be expected to see if the harvest will be accepted or not. So in a positive context, context it means that the harvest is accepted. We find a very good example um, of the number 90 in, in the word. We read that Abraham was, was 90 years or 99 years old when he received the promise from Abba. And Abba said to him, um, Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said, I am the almighty Elohim. Walk before me and be perfect. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of thee. And kings shall come out of thee. And this is such a beautiful promise that I think we must all, you know, it's also a prophetic promise for us because we are the seed of Abraham. Um, but to remember that Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born, but that was not the harvest or the, the, the fruit that was inspected was not Isaac. The fruit was Abraham's faith, but was inspected and it was accepted by Abba. And Abba gave him this blessing and this promise. And again, the promise had to do with fruitfulness. Um, so we again have that reference back to, to being fruitful. Um, yeah. <laughs> and also, sorry, yeah, Sarah was 90 when she became pregnant. So this whole story of Abraham and Sarah has to do with the harvest and, and standing in, in fruitfulness before Abba. Then another good example that we find in the word um, is of the 99 sheep where 
Yeshua says, isn't it worth going after one sheep that is lost? What good does it do to, to go after the 99 that does not need um, rescuing? So if they do not need rescuing, it means that there's no need at that moment for repentance. So it means that they've already been inspected and accepted and they're already in the fault. And then there's only a need to go after the one who is still lost. So the ordinal number of Tzad is 18. And what I mean by, by ordinal is it's just the, the order in the alphabet. It's the 18th letter of the alphabet. Um, but it is the numerical value of Chai. So which was just a good connection again, because Chai means life. And even though the ordinal number is 18, which refers to life, the numerical value is 90, which refers to an accepted harvest or fruitfulness. And again, referring to Sarah, who had life inside of her at the ripe age of 90 years old when she became pregnant. Okay. So that is our study for the, <laughs> the letter Tzad. I hope you found... Um, Found it interesting. So let's continue quickly to our word studies for tonight. I see we are quite on time. I think I can relax and take a breather because I don't want to keep you the whole night. Um, but let's quickly um, do the word studies. Let's take our time with them. And then we will um, talk a little bit more about the letter side. So the first word study that um, I took for tonight is the word bana. So please take a piece of paper and, and write the word down. I want you to, to practice and first try to see how many of the meanings of each letter you can remember from the top of your head. Um, on the next slide, I, I did write, write, write them out for you, but I want you to practice and see um, how much you can remember. So while you are doing that, I'm just going to talk about um, the word bana and the meaning behind it because it will help you to understand and look for a deeper meaning in the in the pictures. So bana means to turn, but it's also translated as to look, to prepare, to regard, and to respect. Um, meaning, if I say it means or is also translated as look, it's to literally to turn your head and look in a certain direction. So to change direction and look from one place in a sp specific direction. So it also means face, because it means to turn your face towards someone or something. Um, more specifically, the word bana, which means turn or face, means to a back and forth turning of the face. So in other words, doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this, and why? What, what does it refer to? So this is very beautiful. So we read in the Bible, um, we read of the tabernacle, and you all know that I speak a lot about the tabernacle, but we um, read about the tabernacle, and in the um, um, Holy of Holy, oh, not the Holy of Holies, in the holy place, you had uh, the three items. You had the menorah on the left, which symbolizes the spirit. And then you had the incense altar at the front, in front of the, the veil um, that you had to pass bef before you go into the, the Holy of Holies. And then on your right, you had the table with the bread, the 12 pieces of bread. So in your Bible, in the English Bible, it talks about the sh show bread or the shoe bread. And if you look in the Hebrew, there's another word inserted there. It's called the panahim. So in Hebrew, you read about the lechem panahim, the bread of his faces, was the, uh, that had to be before um, him continually. So actually, this word panahim repeats in some verses, it repeats twice. It will say the lechem panahim panahim, because panahim can also mean before to be in somebody's presence. So it will say the bread of his faces before. And that was so interesting to me. 
Um, firstly, because um, bana, like I've just showed you, means face. So banahim is the plural form of face. It means faces because it refers to the many characteristic and faces of Abba. I um, mean, one of the previous lessons I, I spoke to you about um, really knowing and understanding Abba's heart and his character. And if you don't know him, for example, as Al Roi, um, the God who sees, if you maybe feel that he doesn't see your needs, or maybe you don't know him as, as Yahuwah Rafa, the God who heals, do you know all of his faces? But the whole thing about Lechem um, Panahim, that this bread, this shoe bread that was in the tabernacle, is symbolic of the word of God. Okay? And across from that, on the other side of the room, you had the menorah, which is symbolic of um, his set apart spirit. So you, you are not supposed to read the word and study the word without the light, without the menorah. Because it's the menorah that casts light onto the word and gives, it gives you revelation. But while doing that, while studying his word, you are supposed to constantly look towards the holy of holies, to look towards his throne, to look towards his face and seek him and try to understand him and seek his face in the word um that was just a very beautiful um yeah explanation to me of the word panaim or pana so let me quickly give you mm, this is exactly the same Okay, sorry, I put the same slide in there twice. So in this slide, I just added the, all the definitions of each of the letters. I'm just going to leave that on for a couple of minutes. So you can go through that and see what I've explained to you now, what Pana means. Um, and also, um, I'm just going to speak and, and share some more while you look at this. Um, it's also the whole concept of whenever you receive a teaching or you receive word that you have to, to turn and go to Abba with it and taste it with Abba. Abba is this true? Is this who you are? Is this interpreted right? And not to take everything um, with your own intellect. Um, but also to allow the word to change you. Um, and when you get that revelation of sin in your life to repent, and you will be changed into his character. Um, so there's again so many levels um, to understanding and to looking at this. So um, we have the letter pay, which means side, hunt, chase ambush, hide, journey, trail, stronghold, and need. We've got nun, which can mean seed, air, inheritance, life, continue, new generation, and sun. We have the letter hay, which can mean behold, look, breath, sigh, reveal, spiritual, repentance, and fruitful. So taking all of those meanings into consideration and then also the meaning of Pana, what deeper meaning can you see or find? If anybody has anything to share, please do so on the chat, on the chat box. Anybody? Must I give you some more time? 
Is anybody still busy? I'm just going to go one slide back. If you just want to go over the meaning of Bana again. Thank you, Pietri. So Pietri says, the journey of a new generation in Yeshua needs to be a spiritual one. Wow. Okay, so let's go. Just want to go to the next slide. Oh. Where am I now? <clears throat> the journey, which it will be now pay, okay, of a new generation, which is the letter Nun, in Yeshua needs to be a spiritual one, which is the letter A. Wow, Pietru, <laughs> I'm really amazed at your answer. It's a beautiful interpretation. Um, that is the, the, the Joshua generation who never went out of the tabernacle. Um, we need to look for the spiritual um, fulfillment and implication of Abba's word and not just the letter of the word, but the spirit of the word. That's really, really beautiful. Um, anybody else? You can still share. I'm just going to share with you what I saw. So the, 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 the words that stood out for me was journey. It was life and also repentance. I'm keeping in mind now again of constantly looking at his word with the light of the Holy Spirit and then looking back to Abba and where you are convicted to repent and to change. So Pana, which also means face or turn, what turns back and forth in reference to the tabernacle, we need to seek his face back and forth when studying his word. Sorry, so the three letters that I of the three words, journey, life, and repentance, is to turn and journey in a life of repentance. So that's for me, when you go through the whole um, tabernacle journey, if you haven't done the tabernacle webinar with my sister please please um it's already been done but i mean you can do the videos in your own time please do so because we discussed this in detail but if you look at the journey of the tabernacle and how you can grow spiritually it's only when you enter um um the holy part where you really go into a deeper relationship with him and that's where true repentance starts in the beginning it's only you being born again and and, and starting to see what he did for you on the cross and, um, you know, also laying down your own life and deciding to go to lay down your flesh and go through the mikvah, through the water. And also then you start to read the word, looking into the, the wash basin, which, which, was, which was like a mirror. And you would look in that and you will see your own image for what it is because you will look into the word and you will start seeing the sin in your life and, and start to identify your true nature. And that will urge you to want to walk a life of Yeshua, to change. And then you will enter the tabernacle. You would want to tabernacle with him. And only when you are inside, you start to, to really seek his face and, and decide to walk this, this um, life of repentance. Um, the pictures can also mean to chase or to follow the trail to find the fruitful seed of his character. Because I believe when you are convicted of sin in your life or in your soul, and maybe, for instance, you, you realize that, um, you know, you worry easily, you worry about the future and, and you are convicted of that and you repent of that and then you look to Allah. And he will then give you that seed of faith, not to worry. So every time that you repent, Abba gives you seed to grow that fruit in the place um, where the sin was. So it's through his seed and through his grace that you are changed into his image. And that all only happens when you, when you enter the, the tabernacle. Does anybody else want to share anything? Or can we continue? So <laughs> let me quickly give you the homework um, for, for, tomorrow, um, for the next week. So the homework I want to give you is 
um, Pesach. So again, we are in the um, festive season. Obviously, Pesach is the first, um, the start of the, the festivals of the biblical festivals, and it's only in the beginning of the year, which is usually around April. Um, but the word Pesach in Hebrew literally means to pass over. That's why it's also translated as Passover. But because most of you are familiar with the festivals, it's nice for me to use this as a, uh, as a way to break it open for you. So, okay. Pesach is spelled Pei, Sin, and Chet. So please write that down and, and go practice at home and sit with the letters and may Abba really reveal to you a deeper understanding and a deeper meaning regarding um, the Pesach season and what it's truly about. So yeah, that is the end of our lesson <laughs> regarding the, the, the letters um, Pei and the letters Tzad. I then want to share with you some more about the letter Tzad. Um, I am recording and I'm going to continue to record. I'm just going to ask Charlene to maybe stop her recording, if possible. I don't know if it is possible and then just to re-record. Um, I'm not going to stop my recording on my side because I'm, I really want to capture this last piece individually. Um, so we can forward and share it with friends um, because it's really something so special and I really don't think it's something that <laughs> we can keep for, keep for ourselves. So I'm just quickly going to um, pause. Um, I'm going to exit the share screening. Where do I do this now? Okay. And if anybody quickly wants to take a break, like literally two minutes, if you quickly want to get a glass of water, or if you... So we're going to look at some more um, info regarding the letter Tzad. So every week when I do the, the study um, of, the, of the letter, I look at a, a couple of different sites. And I was reading on this one site about... Um, the letter Tzad, but it's more, um, they lean very much towards the, the Jewish side and, and what the scribes so believe. And sometimes there's some very interesting finds. Anyway, so I read something about the letter Tzad and it really intrigued me. And the more I read, the more Abba showed me. And then he reminded me of one of my disciple schools. So I've, I've spoken a lot about it. It's in Afrikaans. Um, I think many of you or most of you that are on here tonight either attended it live or you've watched the, the videos. But he reminded me of my last disciple school, the one on epigenetics. But I don't want to say more. Let's first start and let's see where he takes this. Um, and please, if you find something amazing, just comment for me while um, it's just... It's really difficult to not be able to see faces and, and talk to an audience. Um, just want to open my chat again. Okay. Okay. I'm going to read some because all of this was really new. So, we are back at the letter Tzad, okay? So, remember that in the beginning when we looked at the meaning of the pictures, I said a couple of things, uh, but one of the things that I said was um, the side of the door and what does that mean and that we will look at the end. What does this refer to? So, I read about the scholar. His name was Isaac Luria. He lived in the... 15th or 16th century, long ago. <laughs> but he wrote, and he had this theory, it was just very beautiful to me. Again, not being theologic, if this is correct or not correct or biblical, it was just a very interesting theory that he had. So he wrote that when Yahuwah created 
the heavens and the earth. When he created, he created by an act of what they call timdum. I don't know exactly how to pron pronounce that, but it's spelled with a tzad. Tim tum. And this concept, this word, refers to the bigness, the greatness of Abba. And that he is so big and powerful that um, his being um, just um, encompasses everything. That when he is and when he is um, in his fullness, there's no place for anything else. That to be able to create us and, and to create the earth, he had to make himself less to make room for the earth and for us. And that was just mind blowing to me already, just like that. He was so great, but had such a need for company and for us that he made himself less to make space to create us, okay? So this is what the concept or the word timtum means, which starts with the letter tab. So I'm gonna take it slow because I really want you to follow. And if you want me to repeat or to explain anything again, um, please say so. So this concept of timtum connects with the letter Tzad. And it connects with the creation story, just as I have explained now. And thus, it, it connects us with the creator himself. And as you remember, the very first letter of the alphabet that we looked at was the letter Al, the letter Aleph, and that the letter Aleph was symbolic of the creator himself, because he's the first, the last, he's everything. Okay. Then also, the letter Tzad also has a connection with the righteous one, the righteous ones, or sorry, to be righteous. So the word for righteousness or righteous in Hebrew is Tzadik. The Tzadikim is the righteous ones. And Tzadik also starts with the letter Tzad. And the concept with being righteous and being righteous in your relationships is to make yourself less and others more. Remember, I think it's in the whole thing about love in 1 Corinthians 13, that is about putting others before you and putting their needs before you. So it's making yourself less and others more. Okay, so just keep a note of each of these statements. So what they also said on this site that I was reading, um, the, scholars call the, the scholars call the letters Aleph and Tzat, they call it mates, that they belong together. And I couldn't really understand why at first, um, but then I, I went to do further studies on other sites and, it, and, and the reason for them calling them Aleph and Tzat mates is because they look similar. Now remember, some of these scholars are not even believers in Messiah. So I took the modern Hebrew letters and I've placed them here for you so you can see the similarity. So they're only similar in the top half, not in fullness, but the top half um, looks quite similar. And because they call the Aleph and the Tzat mates, that they belong together, we know now already that Aleph refers to Abba or to Yeshua. For all these reasons I've shared on the first page, they say that Aleph refers to the bridegroom and thus the Tzat, the righteous ones, refers to the Kalat Mashiach, who is the bride. So, these two letters, the Aleph Tzad refers to Yahusha and his bride. And I found this was, you know, a very, very beautiful picture. And I decided, okay, I want to, you know, add this, this to tonight's lesson. But the more I, I read on this, 
I will just keep breaking things o open to me. And then he reminded me of something that I taught in one of the um, disciple schools in the epigenetics one. So before we get there, <laughs> which was further, what, which was very interesting is that we already know now that Tzad, the letter Tzad has the numerical value of 90. And we know it refers to having acceptable fruits, having an acceptable harvest. And that was just, again, confirmation to me that the letter Tzad can refer to the bride because <laughs> the word says that those who bear fruit will inherit the kingdom of Yahusha. So, yes, there are many things that are expected of, of us, but what we will be inspected of when he decides if we are accepted or not, is if we are bearing fruit or not. Um, if you are a believer, if you keep Torah, if you know him, if you've done, um, you know, if you have a deliverance uh, ministry and, and you've cast, casted out devils, all of that, if you don't have fruit in your life, if you don't have the fruit of the spirit, the character of Yahusha, you will not be accepted into the, the wedding chambers, okay? So it's definitely a fruitful harvest refers directly to the bride. So that was confirmation to me that this Aleph Tzad thing is sound and, and that it can refer to Yeshua and his bride. So then I thought, but, oh, okay, I wonder if there's a word in ancient Hebrew that is spelled Aleph Tzad. So I went into the lexicon and I looked it up. So I found the word atz, and it means to press in, and it also means narrow. And I was like, what? Um, because immediately it reminded me of two things. Um, yeah, except for that we are in a season of the world where we really need to press into Abba, where we really need to press into our relationship with Yeshua. Um, it also reminded me of, again, the 10 virgins the parable of the five wise virgins. And I did speak about this in a previous lesson, but, and I said how the extra oil to me refers to the, the oil that is supposed to come from our own lives. When we start bearing fruit and we get into difficult situations and we are pressed, what do we produce? Do we produce sour wine or do we produce healing oil? And it was just amazing when I saw, okay, it means press, but it also means narrow. Again, the reference came up to me that he says there's a narrow gate and a few find it. So again, in the reference with the remnant of the end time bride. But if we look at the word pictures of the word arts, it means the strong need. <laughs> that was just so beautiful to me because it's the strong need that a bridegroom and a bride share for each other. So again, Aleph is the bride, Tzad, Ach Aleph is the bridegroom, Tzad is the bride. And the word itself means, in the picture form, the strong need that they have for each other. But to make it even more beautiful, I saw that this is the parent root. So Atz is the parent root for the word <clears throat> um, to press in. But to form the word press, they add another letter. So the word for press is formed when you add the vav, the nail, between the Aleph, the husband, and the wife. <laughs> it was just like, what about just revelation upon revelation? So the husband is secured to the wife through the crucifixion. In obviously here I'm referring to Yahusha is secured to his wife through the blood and through what he did for us, taking us into this new covenant. This leads to another one of my teachings about the bride um, and, and what he really came to do for us um, to become the bride. So Again, just a deeper revelation of this. Um, so this word with the added vav to press means to press or to be close. 
to be really close to one one's heart, to stay close to another, you know, as a shepherd and his flock, as a bride and his bridegroom. But in the definition they give it, to press into or unto something, causing it to move. And that again was just another layer of confirmation because again, it was a reference to, um, I speak about that also in the bride teaching, um, of the story of Jacob and how we need to wrestle um, with Abba until we get him to move. Not that he's not able to move, but he wants us to fight with him, to struggle with him. Um, and, and not in a form of rebellion, that's not my heart, but, but not to take, no, but to wrestle with him as Jacob did until it, lead, it left Jacob limp. And he changed his name and he changed his name to Israel, which means to overcome in God and to reign with God. Um, and that just takes me back to that scripture, that promise that was given to Abraham that said, um, out of your seed will come kings. And that is so prophetic because I know it's also reference to the order of Melchizedek to be priests and kings. And those who walk in that order, again, will be the bride. Um, so there was just so many layers of confirmation. And this was such a good example to how beautiful and how deep the Hebrew is. Um, but this is just the beginning. <laughs> so what I want to share with you next, just it, it really blew my mind. So when I was looking at this, and I looked at the modern Hebrew letters, and this is just Abba. And the, the spirit just reminded me of what I shared in the epigenetics teaching. And I looked at the Aleph Tzad and I saw this looks so familiar. It looks like something I've, I've seen before. So <laughs> my last theme or my last teaching in the whole um, Disciple School series is about epigenetics. Um, I'm not going to share the whole thing because it's a long teaching. Um, but you can go watch it on your own time. Um, for those of you who have seen it, I'm going to refresh your memory. So, again, I'm no expert. I don't even know if this is possible or makes sense on a medical level. I'm no, no expert. But what Abba has shown me, I believe, is a spiritual revelation. Um, so, what I do know is that we as humans we have 46 chromosomes okay um we've got 23 pairs so we inherit 23 from our mother and you inherit 23 from your father's side and when you are formed so your egg cell has 23 and the sperm has 23 and when it's combined you as a human will then have 46 okay so the last set of chromosomes um, in your DNA um, will determine if you will be male or female. So the male chromosome um, is an XY or it is translated into understand, understandable language as the XY chromosome and female is the XX. So again, what you see here, the shape of the chromosomes and the size is not necessarily an accurate presentation. It's just to give a diagram so people can better understand, um, you know, that there are different chromosomes and they will maybe tell you that this gene is found on the third chromosome. So you inherit one from your father, one from your mother. And if they both have this gene in their chromosomes, you will have maybe like blue eyes or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you get the point. So it's not a physical accurate representation. But what I found very interesting was that the number 46, the numerical value or symbolic meaning of the number 46, means a testing of the flesh or a physical struggle. Remember what I've just said about Jacob being limp after struggling and fighting um, with Abba until he overcame. Okay. So 
So as I've said in the disciple school, what I'm about to suggest next is really out of um, Stefani chapter 8, verse 10. <laughs> it's really just a question that popped into my mind. But as I discovered uh, more, I really do believe that there's a spiritual lesson in that. So my question was, what if... <laughs> What if Adam had 45 chromosomes and not 46? Okay, so why would I ask something like that? Okay, so my thought was, if Adam had 45, he was complete. He had the complete set of genes. Um, he Abba created him alone. He didn't create from the start male and female he first created adam and then he saw adam had a need so a deep sleep came over adam and then the word says that abba took a rib from the side of adam and he formed the female okay so what really was amazing to me is when i realized the numerical value of the name adam is 45 the numerical value of the word DNA, if you take it from the Hebrew, is 45. So what was also interesting, if you look at the Hebrew word for rib, it refers to something that is curved, which again reminded me of the shape they, they give to a chromosome. But was it, what was even more interesting is when I looked into the Hebrew word for rib. The Hebrew word for rib is tzela, and it's spelled with a tzad. Wow. I didn't even realize that when I did the epigenetics. I didn't even look into the Hebrew word. But then I saw it spelled with a tzad. So there's already a connection. And then I went to see what the meaning is. And the physical meaning of the word tzela is side. I was like, what? That is what the letter tzad also means. It means the side of something. So it means side or it can mean to limp as if missing one side. So when something or somebody walks limp, again like Jacob was limp after he was fighting with Abba. But like maybe let's say you have a table and you take a piece of one of the legs, the table will not be very it will be limp because it's missing a piece of itself and not that it will make okay that was not a good example because it will make the table weak but it's not necessarily um negative it's more in the sense of um again think of the two lovers somebody in a relationship somebody in a marriage when you are not with your husband or you are not with your wife, you feel as if one side is missing and you feel limp. You're not completed until you are together. Okay. So this is how you spell the word tzla. It's tzad, lam, and ayin. So let's look at the meaning of the pictures. You all hopefully understand why we do this to go even deeper. So if we look at the meaning of the pictures, it says, see the side of the shepherd. <laughs> and again, I remembered the word picture of the, word, of the letter tzad, which was the side of the door. And I said, what does this refer to in the beginning? If the door also symbolizes Messiah, and it says the side of the door, the side of Messiah, it means side, the word tzala also means side, and it means see the side of the shepherd. What is there to see at the side of the shepherd? Again, if, if we talk about, um, I talk about it in, in the bright teaching, that there was the first Adam, and as Eve or Chava was taken out of the side of the first Adam, in the same way, the bride will be taken out of the side of Yeshua, our shepherd. Okay. What I found amazing again was that this word, this Hebrew word, tela, appears in the word 45 times. That's the 
amount that I'm saying, what if Adam had 45 chromosomes? Look at his sign. Who was taken out of his sign? The bride. Humankind. So if we were taken out of Yeshua's DNA, out of his sight, so I think, yes, that's a nice picture, but I think on a spiritual level, what happened is that Abba literally took some of Adam's DNA, some of his chromosomes, and he broke that up into another piece. So they will be 46 instead of 45 because 45 cannot be split into two. So he had to take one of Adam's chromosomes and break a piece off so that it will be even, 20, 23, 23. And the reason also for that is when Abba looks at a married couple, he looks at them man and woman, he looks at them one. So that one piece is broken. So only when a man and a woman is one, are they complete? Can Abba, can Abba see them as, as one being? because two of their pieces fit together like a key and a lock. I really hope that makes sense to you. Um, so this word, rib, so remember, just to refresh your memories, the word tala that I'm talking about here is the word for side or rib, the place where Abba um, took out of Adam's side, he used his rib to create Eve. And it's used 45 times. And I'm just like, what? So to take this even further is that um, if you look at, at, the, at the word pictures of, of Adam, you have the, the Aleph, the Dal, and the Mem. So what does the pictures mean? It means the powerful moving blood or the powerful moving liquid that contains the DNA, the seed. Um, the word dam, which is the parent root for Adam, means blood and it also means image, that we were created in his image. Again, referring to 46, meaning a tasting of the flesh, or physical struggle. 46 is the amount of chromosomes we do have and that it can refer to being limp. If one part is removed, we are not whole. We are not whole, okay? So we are almost done. So what is so beautiful to me, what I then realized is if we go all the way back, I hope you're all, all with me <laughs> still. Thank you, Vanita. I see you um, are commenting and that you are enjoying this. Um, to go all the way back. So we were looking at the letter Tzad. And that they were saying that the letter Aleph, which refers to the bridegroom, and the letter Tzad refers to the bride, the bride and the bridegroom. And this comes from out of this concept that when Abba created, the universe, the world. Where is that word? Um, the Timtum, okay? That it was all about him making space for us, him making himself less so we can be. So the Aleph Tzad in the modern Hebrew looked familiar to me because it resembled to me those two chromosomes, the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. That's why I remembered this, the X, Y. But then I noticed, okay, but we've got a little problem because it is switched. And at first I couldn't understand it because what did we say? We say if you have an X, Y, it means you are male. It means you are in the fullness of Abba. But if you are XX, you are female. So in short, all males have X, but what I was confused about was the Y chromosome, because here the Y refers to the bride. So why is it switched around? And then I just felt, as I said, it's about turning it upside down. So I left out the team to about creating space for us, making himself less so we can be. When you enter into a relationship with Yeshua, 
you have to make yourself less and make space for him to become what he was. Because now you are one again. So that lock and key is locked in together and you give back to him what he has given to you. I hope that makes sense. And if you do not do that, if you do not make that exchange and give back to him what he has given to you, and if you don't make him to be everything in your life, because now remember, the Tim Tum, he made himself less so you can be. So now you have to make yourself less so he can be Elohim over all of your life. If you don't do that, you will never experience him in his fullness. If you don't do that, you will not enter that role and understand that mindset of being the bride. So that is the long and short of it. I really hope it was not too complicated for you guys to understand um, and that I explained it clearly, rather say that, not too complicated to understand, but that, that I um, explained the concept clearly. Um, yeah, that was, that is the long and the short of it. So I think the big revelation that I had was, it was confirmation for me that um, even in our DNA, that he will redeem us. And this, this walk of sanctification that we are walking has a physical effect on your body. And we have to know that he really longs for us. He needs us as we need him. Um, yeah, yeah, Ushas really is, is, is longing for us. He's limping because he's missing his pride. Um, a part of him is missing if he's not with us. And that just really, it, it touched my heart on a, on a, new, on a new level. Um, and if you are struggling with, with anything health-related even, or any sin, because sin sits in the seed, it sits in the DNA, you must just know that he is true to his word and he will complete us. He will make us one again. Um, yeah. So our 23 and 23 chromosomes in the end is actually 22 and a half and 22 and a half that's supposed to be 45 and we will be one with Yahusha before Abba. Um, thank you for staying up with me <laughs> and listening to, to me and sharing my revelation and being excited with me. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to stop the recording for now. Um, thank you for joining me on lesson 10 about the paid site. Um, but I'm not going to log off. You're more than welcome to still chat with me and ask questions. But for the sake of the recording, I am going to log off now. Have a blessed evening. So, yeah, um, I will give further information regarding next week's lesson on the group. Shalom.